Hello, and welcome to the big issue debate on instant and frictionless cross-border payments. I'm Joy McKnight, editor of The Banker Magazine, which is part of the Financial Times Group. And I have a great panel with me spanning the globe. First, I have Michael Goritz, who's Group, group Chief Information Officer, Technology and Innovation at Standard Chartered Bank. I also have Charlotte Hogg, who's CEO of Visa Europe, and Aether Williams, who is Head of Strategy, Digital Platform and Innovation at Wells Fargo. Thanks so much for joining me for this interesting debate. So the pace of change in the payment space was already accelerating and around 50 countries are going live with domestic real-time payment systems. But there's also been this big drive to improve cross-border payments through industry initiatives like SWIFT GPI. Then the COVID-19 pandemic hit and the pace of change was really turbocharged as the whole world shifted to digital. Having the ability to quickly adapt to changing circumstances as well as maintaining a high level of service is very important in this new world. And unsurprisingly, many banks are reevaluating their strategy based upon the rapid change over the past two years. Uh, Aether, I was going to pose the first question to you. Um, so how is Wells Fargo responding to the market shifts and what impact have the past two years had on the business and has it changed your payment strategy and if so how has it changed it yeah well first of all joy thanks for uh, for having me it's wonderful to see you again it's been a been a few years um so the last the last two years have been transformational first of all i think it's made a quantum shift in how customers want to interact with their their worlds um a lot of things were physical now they've moved to digital and I don't think that's going to go back. And so when I look at our engagement numbers across the board, they're all up, you know, well into the double digits. And we're seeing about 1.8 billion interactions with our clients per quarter on our on our digital property, so either our mobile app or our, our online offering. Um, and that is um, steadily increasing, and that's across all demographic groups. So I think that's uh, a, a fundamental thing. The other thing we're seeing is a drastic increase in payments. So when I look at digital initiated payments, so here in the US, Zelle is one of the uh, real-time payment networks or initiation forms we can use to do P2P payments and increasingly P2B. Um, and those numbers are up 25% or more per quarter and they're growing pretty rapidly as people are starting to realize that they can do things um, more quickly on their mobile, mobile phones and engage in the rest of the world for banking. So I think that's, um, that's a key. The other side of it is we're seeing obviously a lot of growth in gig workers. So among our client base, our 69 million clients, on the consumer side, we've got you know a significant chunk of those are consumers. They're often the gig workers, and so we're also looking at now the other side of that and how we can pay out to them faster. Um, and that's a, that's a demand. So and then eventually you're going to hear you've got a path of having to look at how you incorporate that income into their view on lending. So they want to borrow. How do you think about that from a um, asset-based lending perspective or a um, real-time basis. So it's changing pretty quickly, but I think the, um, the mobile trend, digital trend is here to stay. So we've adopted what we call uh, a mobile-first mindset. So it's not mobile, it's mobile first, but not mobile only. We still see a million or so visits a day to our branch network. Uh, and so it's really important for us to start things with, with mobile and digital and then have that experience translate across our channels. So we really have a fluent omni-channel strategy. So there's a contact center, a branch, uh, a financial advisor's office, or our digital properties. And so we're spending a lot of time and energy synchronizing those experiences and focusing our efforts there. Excellent. And Charlotte, I was going to pose the same question to you in terms of, you know, how has this big shift changed maybe your business, but then also maybe your payment strategy? So, so I, I, completely agree that there's been a fundamental shift to digital at multiple levels actually over the last couple of years. Firstly, I think consumers moved to embrace digital payments to a greater degree and with a greater breadth than we'd ever seen. And that's both, you know, physically where this move to contactless has been has been huge, you know, in Europe now, well over 80% of transactions face to face are now contactless. But it's also online as as well. And I'd agree that, that what's happened is not a sort of discontinuity, but that the pace of change is fundamentally accelerated. And one of the things I think we have to be careful of in these kinds of debates where we, we, we know and love our content so much is to lose sight of what it is that payments do for people. 
right? And, and sort of there are some fundamental human needs that that are unchanging in this mist of change, and they are around feeling secure and feeling in control. And, and we collectively as an ecosystem and an industry have to keep staying anchored on those. So as you think about what does, what does consumer trust look like and how do you continue to deliver on it in a world where people are expecting more digital, more transparent, more personalized um, and faster? And how do you make consumers feel like they are managing to hold on to all the different aspects of their financial life? So all the work we all do collectively to think about resilience security i think become ever more important and frankly i'd like to see more of a debate across the entirety of the ecosystem around what availability looks like in the future what it really means and what it's going to take to deliver on that the other aspect that i think becomes more important when you keep staying anchored on those beliefs is around uh, competition and how do you create structures and payment ecosystems that welcome lots of different providers i mean none of us knows exactly what you know, you know use cases are going to emerge for businesses and consumers in the future if we if we did that would be an extraordinary thing but we don't so how do you create the structures that enable new players to emerge and provide for consumers and equally for businesses to create economies that are going to thrive and be inclusive in the future um, because we know that there's so many different use cases whether they're cross-border or whether they're domestic that increasingly businesses and consumers are relying on and where digital is really solving problems of inclusion uh, you know, in ways that we never imagined. I mean, one of my favorite stories from, from the pandemic is where in partnership with La Caixa, we created virtual food banks when the physical ones had to close down. Now that would never have happened without the impetus. So as we, as we look into the future, how do you maintain the trust? How do you increase the openness to competition um, in order to allow the innovation that we all know to, to come and for consumers and businesses to continue to feel safe and to continue to feel like they have real choice. Excellent. So I'm going to come back to the whole ecosystem play in a couple of minutes. But first, I was going to sort of pose the same question to Michael in terms of how it's been impacting your business and your strategy, but then also what challenges has your cross-border businesses faced and then how are you responding to these challenges? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, also thank you for having me uh, being part of that panel. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Senator Tata, as you know, we operate in Africa, Middle East and Asia. And uh, I think it's fair to say that uh, the instant payment systems, they picked up in Asia um, uh, very, very early. And uh, since people are really getting used uh, to this notion of uh, instant payment um, in a national uh, environment, th they started to, to demand uh, the same uh, convenience and uh, speed yeah, in cross-border. So therefore, it's, uh, I mean, just I'm, I'm living here in Singapore since six years, and it's, it's really remarkable how easy it is today to pay. I mean, you, you scan a QR code or you, you, you go to the wet market and you pay um, uh, uh, instant payment uh, with an instant payment uh, schema. So as I said, so very early on, um, we experimented uh, with other partners. For example, in Hong Kong, uh, we um, installed uh, together with Alipay Hong Kong and Gcash in Philippines, uh, a cross-border payment uh, schema uh, where predominantly foreign worker in a uh, foreign domestic worker in Hong Kong uh, could remit uh, money through a mobile wallet uh, into the Philippines. That was very early. Um, and when the pandemic hit, uh, these kind of capabilities, they were in higher demand than ever. We saw a couple of trends. Uh, we saw that the seniors, as Aether pointed on the bandwagon, uh, we saw a 62% increase in seniors, uh, seniors meaning uh, people uh, elder than 60, uh, like me, um, uh, using uh, these digital payments um, uh, very, very, very eagerly. So uh, now the question is, how do we take it from here? because the business is demanding uh, solutions uh, which are easy and which span uh, the whole variety between uh, retail and wholesale. So for uh, how did it change our strategy? I mean, um, as I said, we have started a lot of initiatives already, but the, the pandemic definitely has even boosted uh, our investment in these, uh, in these areas. And uh, well, I'm happy to report that we roll out our new 
cloud-based uh, payment system uh, in all of our footprint countries, which are 59. Um, and uh, we are also uh, improving uh, the interface to our uh, to the treasury, the corporate treasurer, so that all means of payments uh, in an international uh, environment uh, can be integrated or are integrated uh, uh, through one uh, 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 window of uh, one pane. So that's that's the thing we are working on, and uh, it's very exciting. Yeah. Excellent. Um, and then, Charlotte, I was going to come back to this idea of building the ecosystem. Um, what has the last two years, in, you know, how has the last two years impacted your acquisitions, but also collaborations and partnerships? And you touched on a few of them already. Um, but again, looking forward, uh, where do you see these really playing a role within your business? I mean, what's been what's been sort of one of the unsung cures of of uh, this last couple of years is the degree of innovation that there has been, and then and the multitude of, of of different types of services that have emerged to particularly bring small businesses online. You, you, the, you know, we we've talked about consumer behaviours changing, but I think businesses increasingly recognise that a physical presence alone. Is, is, is not good enough as your only plan. You need a plan B and a plan C, and it's increasingly going to be one that's that's omni-channel in the way that's been described. Uh, so the, the level of, of innovation about, you know, that enables small businesses to be brought online has been very important. Um, last year in June, we, we committed globally to digitize 50 million small businesses. And I'm pleased to say we've, we've, we've now helped to digitize with partners, uh, 16 million of those around the world. And a, and a number in Europe. So, so that innovation and having a network that welcomes many different kinds of providers is is important. If I look back to the the old days when when VZ Europe was owned by 441 banks, kind of inevitably that kind of structure perhaps wasn't as welcoming to fintech as we as we now can be. And then on the acquisition side, you know, we are a great believer that you want to provide new capabilities to those who are participants in our network. Uh, so whether it's the announced, recent announcement of the acquisition of Currency Cloud um, or, the, or the equally recent announcement of, of the acquisition of Tink, that's all about providing new services to the participants in our network. And, and Europe, of course, is the epicenter of, of open banking with you know, 400 players now making use of of apis in different forms as aisps or pisps and so there's a real innovation in the space of new products that can help consumers or businesses make decisions differently but deliver it through through the ecosystem excellent and aether i was going to ask the same question to you which is um you know has the past two years have you really ramped up those kind of collaborations and partnerships yeah, so I think that the um, the key for us is thinking about partnerships really two ways. One is, what are the skills and capabilities that we need to have inside of the four walls of Wells Fargo that are core? Things that, um, regardless of how customer preferences change, regulatory environment changes, or technology changes, that we as a bank need to have. The second thing is in looking at speed. Is it faster to build those things ourselves? Um, or is it kind of like faster to um, work with an, an outside organization who brings a unique skill set? And so we've kind of looked at, we've done a couple of things in the last couple of years. So one is we've been focused very much on data sharing, data privacy. So we've done a bunch of partnerships and deals with a lot of the data aggregators to give our customers more control over their information that they have out there. So if they want to use another platform um, or want to have multiple financial relationships to manage their own financial ecosystem, how can we have them aggregate that data inside of us so that we can give them control over it, make sure it's secure. And so they're not having their bank credentials kind of sprawled out all over the ecosystem. That'd be number one. Number two is we recently announced a partnership with both Google and Microsoft on cloud. And what that does for us, it frees us from a lot of capital infrastructure, um, capital spent on infrastructure on our own side, but also provides us with infinite scalability. And from my, my um, selfish point of view, it does one really cool thing, which is a lot of start separating the data from the applications which then gives us a world of possibilities um, to really create better experiences, more personalized experiences for our clients. And then <clears throat> lastly, one of the things I, I do run is innovation. So outside of the traditional use of APIs in the large corporate space, we are uh, in our lab, we have a bunch of things going with a few partners to embed our capabilities inside their experiences, which is where I think this whole thing is, seems to be going 
Whereas, you know, in the ecosystem, um, banks are used to people coming to us. If you're doing what you're doing and then you go to your wallet to pull out your card or you go to your phone and tap, or um, in the case, you know, you go to your checkbook or however it is, you go back to the bank. But now we find that people want to be in the flow. And so that's change of things like Uber, where you're kind of doing your thing and then payment just happens on the back end, which is a combination of all of us on this on this panel sort of working together to make that happen. So how do I think about our capabilities to embed um, the ability to people to see their balances, to make a payment, to borrow money, uh, to manage their investments into what they're doing? So whether it's buying a home, renting, you know, renting a car, uh, or shopping online. And so that's kind of the place we're looking at. How can we enhance those capabilities to really allow our clients to, have, to work in their ecosystem who can be there with them, whether it's physically at a point of sale via a wallet or an API and in, in a digital experience. Uh, so, Michael, again, how has the past few years really impacted the idea of ecosystems, your collaborations, your partnerships, um, and acqu even acquisitions? And then has that actually um, changed via region? Yeah, as I said, um, we basically accelerated our our uh, total journey into uh, the payment space uh, while we were experimenting in the beginning with as i said with um, alipay hong kong or with gcash in philippines uh, we very early on had a uh, in 2015 we started um, a partnership with Ripple, where we um, experimented or actually give uh, more than an experiment, we, we give uh, possibilities for our corporates to do cross border payments. But um, it, now, and in Africa, uh, we have the mobile wallets, which are pervasive over there. So, very early on, uh, we had a lot of interaction uh, with um, uh, the mobile wallet providers um, in Kenya and other countries uh, how to connect uh, corporate payments into these uh, type of uh, new payments. So, when the pandemic obviously uh, broke, uh, this accelerated. And, and, and simply, we were looking um, for more partnerships who, who could actually help us. Uh, to uh, to give the give the best service and convenience to our clients, so what we had to do is uh, to uh, make the foundations internally. So all our payment systems are obviously based on APIs. They are uh, built in the cloud, uh, which means, uh, as Aether said, it gives you scalability and it can help you to put the data where the data should be. And uh, then, obviously, the extension to the outside uh, is uh, the partnerships uh, which we um, are continuing to uh, invest in. So the recent investment which we made was in a, or a joint venture with a partner, um, um, Assembly Pay in Australia, and uh, they have emerged with Currency Fair uh, in Europe, which is a cross-border payment specialist. So there are many smaller activities uh, which are going on, and uh, but the, uh, the, the whole strategy is go full steam into uh, the payment space because that's it. That's what our customers uh, want and what they uh, what they expect uh, as part of our service portfolio. Excellent. Um, so I'm going to go on to another sort of big industry change which is happening. This year marked the start of uh, the migration to ISO 20022 standards. Uh, and while the original deadline uh, for migration was delayed by about a year to November 2022, the industry has already started to prepare for this big change, which is really considered to be, with all the people I speak to, they seem to think that this is really essential for the modernization of payment systems across the globe. So ISO 2022 messages will provide richer and higher quality structured data, which can eventually lead to new solutions and improved customer experience and an overall reduction in friction in payments. Uh, and obviously data plays a really important part in payments. So let's sort of explore that area. Um, Charlotte, uh, what innovation do you think will result from the move to uh, these new standards, ISO 20022? Well, if I may express a slightly contrary opinion, uh, I, I do think one shouldn't assume that you've solved every interoperability just because you've got one standard. And in fact, every time I think you go down the path of a single solution, uh, and it's a technical solution, my guess is that we're in the wrong place. Because by doing so, you're beginning to create single points of failure in various ways. Interoperability is a really important issue, but it happens at multiple levels. And, and there's one which is around standards, and it's obviously you know, good and important progress towards broadening the depth of information that you can carry with a, a payment message. 
The other part of interoperability, of course, is regulatory. If you want to think about what puts breaks into a transaction better than anything else, it's a change in regulatory structure as you cross borders. So all I'm argue, I'll be arguing for is yes, and let's think about all aspects of interoperability, particularly the regulatory one, and also recognize that it isn't the solution to all your problems. So to give you a, to give you a sort of real life example, uh, we have a capability called Visa Direct, which enables push payments to consumers' accounts. Well, over the past year, we, trans we, we processed about 3.5 billion transactions, but over multiple networks using multiple standards. So we used 16 different card-based networks, 65 different ACH networks, seven fast payment schemes, and five different gateways. Now, actually, there's a whole bunch of messaging standards on each one of those, which kind of demonstrates my point, is that you, it isn't the answer to all of our problems technical solutions can resolve a whole number of things. And just because we're moving down the path to ISO 2022, let's not forget this more holistic sort of work towards what, what real interoperability is and think that we've solved a problem when, when we probably haven't. Okay, I like the controversy. And so I'm going to ask Michael as well, sort of, you know, what do you think about Charlotte's statement? But then also, you know, do you think there'll be more innovation off the back of ISO 22 possibility? Well, yeah, actually, I, I would challenge uh, Charlotte a little bit uh, because technology can certainly enable innovation. And, and what uh, ISO helped us to do is uh, to increase our um, uh, zero touch rate uh, because we, we upfront get better quality of data. And, and this um, obviously to correct some some breaks in the in the in the in the, in the payment flow but uh, moreover in the in the compliance work uh, which has to be done in international payments so therefore the 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 quality uh, requirements uh, to to initiate a payment they are higher and uh, you you get much more specific data uh, with iso and therefore yeah that's a that's a big enablement for 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 speed and actually for cost for the banks um it's therefore and, and we have to also differentiate between the the, the retail space and the, and the wholesale space. Uh, and in the wholesale space, uh, the, 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 there are still banks out there you know, among the fifteen thousand who don't exactly know how to format a Swift message. You know? And actually, with ISO, they they are really they are really forced uh, uh, to to put higher quality data upfront in there, uh, which makes all kinds of uh, processes easier uh, for the for all uh, participants. So therefore. I believe that um, ISO is a huge step forward, but I agree with Charlotte. It's not the only uh, solution uh, to the problem, uh, but it's a it's a it's a it's an important ingredient, and uh, we are fully embarking on it and, and driving it within our network uh, as much as we can. Okay, and Aether, uh, do you want to come in on this debate? Um, but I also want to talk a little bit about you know uh, in terms of using that data, you know, in the future role within your business. Um, and then where can data really be leveraged to the greatest effect? Yeah, so it's actually an interesting conversation. So I think that we, you know, the ISO standard is sort of an acknowledgement of a problem that's been going on for multiple decades. And having spent the bulk of my career in transaction banking, covering the, the wholesale side of the, of the bank, um, it's a problem that, you know, treasurers and CFOs have been griping about for decades that, you know, why is it that my payment comes in here and the information about what I got paid for comes in somewhere else and there's a huge reconciliation, reconciliation problem. So the first thing obviously is, I know we've launched some products and others as well, where we can help clients auto reconcile. And I think that's gonna be, you know, a step one, but also what it does, it's gonna drive um, a lot of the benef beneficiaries of payments, particularly on the corporate side, to sort of set their systems up so they can actually handle the data, so on the ERP side, which I think gives us some huge opportunities. Um, but we're sort of looking at it, um, almost taking a, a disruptor's mindset and saying you know, there's a lot of complexity in sort of ISO running through the entire stack of what Swift does and everything else. And so if we were going to be a third party coming into the space saying this is insane, how do we make this cleaner? You would challenge sort of the core beliefs that we have and you would come at it and say, well, one, there's too many parties involved. And so to Charlotte's point, you know, there's multiple layers in this or in, in here and there's large banks and small banks and there's regulatory regimes. And how do you simplify all of that? And how do you get to a world if you're using a distributed ledger? How do you get to a world where you have a smart contract? 
and the payment and the contract terms and all that auto reconciles and gets and flows you know, instantaneously versus the multi-step process we have today. Um, I also think that the data that you're going to be able to extract using AI from a natural language processing perspective and just sort of pulling it in gives us a couple opportunities. One is um, really helping our clients gain efficiency. So when I think about our corporate clients, as treasurers, they're thinking about their, their scorecard candidly. You know, what, what, how, what am I paying bank fees? What, what are my FX fees, et cetera? So being able to help think about you know, currency hedging or currency opportunities to pay in local currency or manage the risk. Um, because we've talked about earlier, the, the pandemic has extended supply chains and it's created a lot of disruption in supply chains. So managing the risk of that disruption is, is on the treasurer's mind. So it gives us the opportunity to understand what they're doing and how it's happening and how we can help. It also gives us the opportunity to um, embed inside the ERP system um, the, the ability to do financing. So, oh, we see an order come in. You know, let's think about the optimal way to do this, given your cash flow. So I think it creates um, a whole bunch of opportunities, but you have to think about it a little more broadly than, um, okay, now we can we can accurately keep up the travel rule and we can do other things that have money flow and have the data flow with it. But you can really take it and say, what problem are we trying to solve for our clients? Um, and then is there a new way to do that? So I think it's opening up everyone's mind saying, yes, we need to fix this. But given where technology is, given where this, when this debate started, there are other opportunities. And Michael, um, what is your opinion on that? And again, you know, wh where can this data really be leveraged to the greatest effect? Well, uh, on, the, on the data point, yes, th there's more data which has come, comes along. But <clears throat> I would challenge a little bit. I mean, we had data before. Uh, if, if it was not automatically sourced, uh, it, it was somehow collected uh, through the process. So therefore, um, the, the, the data point is a valid one. Um, the question is, uh, who will be the beneficiary? Is it the bank or is it the, the, the customers at the end? Um, and, and, and that's that's obviously something which, which everybody has to take advantage of uh, on themselves. So uh, f for me, the uh, the biggest advantage is, is the more uh, precise definition of the data so that uh, the speed uh, uh, can be enhanced. And if, if there is a... Um, a zero touch payment uh, possible, uh, then there are all kinds of new opportunities which, which were not possible before. Um, and uh, I mean, we have these opportunities in the international payment schema, uh, but now with international uh, payments coming along, uh, there is a whole opportunity on the on the e-commerce space and, and, and services space, uh, which I think we, we now can explore uh, by this new uh, definition. Not, it's, it's not, it's not the, the silver bullet, uh, but it, it gets us uh, further down the road. And Charlotte, do you want to add anything, um, especially in terms of more structured data and, and the impact that that could have on your business? Or maybe to tease out what's, what, what I think is being implicitly said is there's, there's many different types of customers for a payment who want different things at different times. And yes, retail is different from wholesale, but even within retail, you know, I want something different when I'm paying for petrol at a gas station than when I'm walking through um, onto a metro and it needs to be unbelievably fast. Otherwise, certainly in London, someone will throw something at you. You, you, you want different things at different times. And we all need to be able to recognize that. I, I, there's a nice description I've heard that, you know, there's a money transfer. We just take things from A to B and there's a payment. And that's when you add value to that money transfer in the way that the customer wants. And that might be, you know, real speed. I mean, I, you know, we think about authorizing in milliseconds. When we talk about instant payments, quite often we're talking about five seconds, a thousand times slower. Both of these are important, but they're important at different times to different people. So part of what we're teasing out is a recognition that there are many different kinds of customers. We're all delivering payments and the value that comes with turning a money transfer into a payment, which which matters differently. I think the other thing we should not forget from this discussion, particularly for retail payments, is whose data it is. And one of the big transitions we're clearly working into is uh, what our data ethics look like in the future. And at Visa, we spend a lot of time going beyond GDPR to think about what values we should have with how data is used. And so thinking how you give consumers control and value from the use of their data is going to be a very important issue in, for all players. And, and we need to, I think, call that piece out as well. Okay, great. I'm going to shift gears a little bit uh, and move on to uh, specifically cross-border payments. 
Um, obviously, um, there has been a much of an increased focus by both central banks and public sector on improving cross-border payments. Uh, and obviously, the main challenges have been identified as high cost, low speed, limited as access, uh, high complexity and insufficient transparency. So the G20 made enhancing cross-border payments a priority last year, and that's going to continue. And the Committee on Payments and Market Infrastructures, or the CPMI, and the Financial Stability Board released a roadmap last October to reduce the friction in cross-border payments, which served as a, I think it was a real push to the whole industry to take another look at this challenge. Um, so Michael, um, what are current takeaways from that report for you? Uh, and then also, you know, what have been the key changes on how you operate your business? Well, uh, first of all, by by that report and by, by the initiative, we, we see a whole lot of projects uh, coming across. Mm -hmm. and, and these projects are um, have all, all formed and shape. Um, I, I think I, I talked about already the um, the instant payment systems and uh, especially here in Singapore, uh, we, we have one launched already. So there's possible uh, as a retail customer to pay with your instant payment system here in Singapore, uh, a merchant in Thailand or the other way around. Uh, I mean, uh, that's obviously good for, for e-commerce, but it's even better if you uh, uh, have vacation, if this is ever possible again, uh, in Phuket, and you can really pay your, your, your dinner uh, with an instant payment schema uh, which you uh, which you loaded on uh, your your phone uh, here or the other way around. Uh, the, the 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 similar initiative uh, has been announced by the uh, central banks actually last year between uh, last week uh, between uh, UPI the the Indian uh, Reserve Bank of India and uh, Singapore as well. So these are the the two initiatives which are just ongoing. And, and, and show where the market is going. But there are many more. I mean, uh, we, we have the initiative uh, on the crypto uh, uh, on the crypto side uh, where, where people try to, to use cryptos, either stable coins or uh, central bank issues coins uh, to, um, to do cross-border payments. And then obviously everybody knows uh, Bitcoin has been around for a while, uh, which enables cross-border payments. So for us, the big question is, which of these technologies and which of these providers will prevail? We don't know. And, and therefore, we are pretty much participating in all of uh, these initiatives in order just to uh, be active there and then find out where the, the market will um, uh, focus and, and, and what will be the, uh, the, the winning schema. Excellent. And Aether, you know, again, you know, what takeaways did you take from that report? Um, and then how is it impacting your business? Yeah, so I think that the... Um... A couple of takeaways. One, the fact that the report had to be issued, I think, is a wake up call for the industry that we've allowed this uh, complexity to remain in place for way too long. Um, and we've been a little complacent. I would say that the obviously we talked about this a bit earlier, actually a lot earlier, um, the common data store standard. So that's clearly one of the friction points. And I do think that um, I think Charlotte mentioned this earlier. One of the things we still have to figure out how to navigate is the, the regulatory asymmetry. There's just a, a ton of schemes. And so how do we think about managing all those and the requirements of each bank in the jurisdiction and which jurisdiction takes precedent, et cetera. Um, which leads us to believe when we think about our business model is that we've got to, th we got to simplify things. We have to take as many players out of the chain as possible. And I think that um, it caused you to step back and rethink. I think 20 years ago, if you wanted to move money across border, you automatically think about a Nostro and Vostro arrangement and getting a correspondent and sort of going down that route. Um, now, um, as, as Charlotte mentioned, you know, Visa has products, there are Ripple has options, there are myriad options out there to think about how you move money around the world on behalf of your clients. Uh, and so that's, that's changed our mindset. We also think, thought about it less from a banker's bank or bankers to bankers to, and changed our mindset to say, well, what's our client trying to achieve? What's the outcome they want? They don't really want to know how the sausage is made. They just want to get the money there, how they want to get it, when they want to get it, and what information at a certain price and certain currency pair. And so that's caused us to shift um, not only the front end, how we actually start thinking about providing them the options to make a payment, um, but also to think about the infrastructure we put in behind it. And so one of the things we announced um, you know, a little over a year ago was a thing called Wells Fargo Digital Cash, which is our distributed ledger option to move money. We're starting with our branches um, in the US and around the world, but we rapidly have a, a roadmap to think about how we're gonna expand that. And that really is the purpose of making it instant more transparent, secure, um, and also um, 
have the information flow, but take players out of the chain because it just creates more complexity the more people that are involved. Now, there are, there are, again, there are multiple ways to, to move money around the world, and depending on what you're doing. If it's a, you know, hundred hundred million dollar, you know, payment for to close an acquisition is very different than paying a gig worker for you know their morning uh, taxi rides in Singapore. So you have to think about it differently, and there's different ways to do it. But I think simplifying the front end for what the client wants to do, and then thinking about the different avenues to the point Charlotte made about the money movement and the payment being different, meaning settlement and then what information enhances that, you can think about the different rails and sort of put that complexity behind. So it's, it's, it's reset our mindset from instead of having the customer think about, oh, I want to send a wire or I want to send a real-time payment or I want to send you know, an ACH, to think about they just want to make a payment and then let us manage the infrastructure on the back end. Okay. Um, and Charlotte, um, you know, what, what impact do you think this uh, report has had on the community as a whole? And then what do you think the outcomes will be? I mean, I think we welcome the work CPMI has done across quite a broad number of fronts, actually, and and the benefits it has both for cross-border and for uh, domestic by virtue of bishing into issues like res resilience and availability. I mean, if you think what the pandemic, which has caused you know immense suffering, but what it would have been like 10 years ago, even when you know 4G was barely available, when e-commerce was in its infancy, uh, when your options for, for how you might pay for things remotely were much more limited, where if you were shielding, there were no options for how you could send someone out to, to pay for you, get what you needed. You know, I think it's worth pausing and saying, look what, what all of us as an ecosystem have achieved through a, a period of quite extraordinary stress personally, as well as, you know, systemically. You, you, you know, we we have to remember we've come a long way and we've ach achieved a, a lot. And in a sense, we haven't even stopped to celebrate what has been done be because we trusted it that much. And, you know, personally, I'm enormously grateful to our technical teams who have done an extraordinary job to give us the level of availability we have throughout this whole period in really challenging circumstances. So I, I think there's a little bit of stock take of where we're at and what we've managed to achieve and then we need to look forward and one of the things i particularly welcome is more of a debate around what resilience is going to look like in the future because i think it's very important that as an ecosystem and with the public sector we have that debate otherwise we'll move into a world where consumers don't not only sort of implicitly accept what we've got to so far but begin to have expectations of 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 this extraordinary level of availability that that maybe not everyone can deliver to and so talking about what what resilience do you really need what levels of cybersecurity do you really need how do you think about fraud prevention in the future is everyone using the kinds of data and 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 toolkit they can to protect so i think that's a very proper space for the g20 and, and central banks and policymakers to be involved with and it should be happening today because we need to set a path as to what the expectations should be for the future. I also welcome the engagement they have on what are the right structures for all of this? How do you create open ecosystems? How do you create competition? Because it's clear from, from what both Ether and Michael and our experience that the competition is working in cross-border, right? That the UN sustainable, sustainable goals are for 3% cost. Well, you can now achieve that in many, many cases. And even in the space of remittances, which has been you know, one of the big challenges here, you know, our, our, our Visa Economic Empowerment Institute indicates that those costs have come down dramatically over the past couple of years through competition. So we we welcome what they're doing and the balance they have to get right between resilience, openness and competition and get, making sure that they intervene at the right level to not stymie, stymie competition in the interests of of trying to solve a problem that itself is being solved by the market. Uh, first of all, the asymmetry, um, uh, which was uh, talked about, uh, this is very helpful that now the, the governments really took this on as a, a cross-border payments as one of their challenges, so which helps us to, uh, to, to, to have a partner uh, to comply with the regulations and, and have the burden of regulation, not only on our shoulders, but uh, the, the, the governments also, they participate uh, because if they 
officially connect payment systems, then uh, the the uh, the necessity of um, identifying the person you know, is actually more shared uh, than it was before. And 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 then uh, the the second is um, on the uh, what was my second thought. Um, I'll come to that later. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. Aether, do you also want to um, sort of comment, especially on the resiliency part? I think that's really important that Charlotte brought up. Well, I mean, I think I mean to, not to to be redundant, but it's I think it's a it's a great point. I mean, the um, whether it's been the pandemic and the and the spike in um, activity that automatically m migrated to digital platforms, making sure those are resilient. Or I think about, you know, unfortunately, due to climate change, the number of natural disasters that are happening and having um, systems up and running. Um, I do remember being at one Saibos in Osaka, Japan, when Hurricane Sandy hit the east coast of the United States and having to, you know, hop on the line with various regulators to make sure that the wire rooms were up and running and we were able to move money. Uh, and then how do you get physical cash into Manhattan? There's all kinds of issues. So I think that um, thinking about the resiliency of the system overall is something that we need to do collectively, uh, and it's all, in all of our best, best interests. So I think it's a good point. Well, uh, adding, adding to the cost that this was a second point, um, uh, uh, Charlotte is absolutely right. The, 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 the modern fully automated systems in, in cross-border uh, payments, uh, they actually uh, create a new level playing field. Because what they do, um, the FX pools which are needed in order to uh, to balance these payments uh, between the different countries, um, they now depend on because they are fully automated by the by the size of the liquidity pool. Um, so before there was a lot of uh, hands in between, yeah, and our retail customers they ended up uh, to pay enormous uh, FX uh, 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 rates. But now with automated uh, liquidity pools, I mean, the, the cost is there where it should be. And, and this is with the biggest player on the market who have the liquidity to provide. Excellent. Well, I was going to sort of start to do a little, get you guys to do a little bit of future gazing. Um, obviously, what we know is that globalization continues apace. And while it suffers some setbacks, such as the global pandemic or some trade skirmishes. Overall, cross-border payments continue to grow and are an enabler of the global economy, um, especially as we move into a more digitalized world. So the competitive landscape is evolving with new payment services providers, new networks entering the market, which is a threat, but also presents opportunities, I think. So there'll be winners and losers. And the big question is, how do you future-proof future your business? So Aether, um, you know, what do you think are going to be the future challenges to cross-border payments? So to the one, business? I think, that, yeah, it's only one we haven't solved is the anti-money laundering, know your customer sort of regulations around the world. And having uh, run this um, in the wholesale side of a prior institution, it's a big, it's a, it's a big ask. And I think it still interjects friction in, in the system. So how we can solve for digital identity, uh, I think is a, key challenge and opportunity so to fix things going forward. Um, that said, I think that the way I think about future-proofing our business is to be relevant. And it's about hyper-personalization, whether it's on the corporate side or the consumer side. And that travels, um, that's about the data and how we leverage the data. And I think that as an institution where we've been, you know, I would say at least many banks have been slower to adopt is really diving into uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning at the scale you've seen other e-commerce players. You think about what Amazon can offer you as a shopper from a know you who you are and what you want to do or what Google can do. And thinking about what a bank does, it's it's a very it's about wide gap. And so part of what we're building out is the skill set to be able to adapt to that. And I think really taking what we've done in banking, which has been very human centric and saying, okay, I, I'm your personal banker or I'm your corporate banker and I know you as a company. Uh, I know everything about you. I mean, I know about your family and I grew up in the same neighborhood. And so I can use that information I know about you and your company and the markets to sort of bring something to you. That's that scalable. And so, and it's also very person dependent uh, and it's hard to train and make it consistent. And so, but I think technology can allow and now allow us to either supplement those individuals or candidly, you know, bring a lot of insight directly to the client and create scale opportunities. Um, and I think those make the link between the customer and the, and the bank uh, versus the individual banker 
um, or any particular rail which we choose to use. So I think that we're just going to see a rapidly accelerating set of rails change on the back end. New, I mean, the, the, this, when I look at the distributed ledger space, I mean, something new pops up every day. And then whether it's some new form of cryptocurrency or the current raging debate around stable coins uh, and central bank digital currencies, that's all going to continue to, to swirl. It may land somewhere. But if you can cement that relationship with the client, and the more they do with you, the more you know about them, the more you can do for them, that, that shift, I think, will allow us to weather the storm of disruptors and innovation. And then we can think about how we partner on the back end to deliver those services in a very consistent and um, coherent way. Okay, great. And then Charlotte, you know, uh, what do you think are the greatest challenges? And then also, you know, what fr frictions can the community address together um, to solve these pain points? And then how, really? <laughs> Which is a $50 million question, I think. I, I thought I might focus on three topics. One is this global versus local issue. And I, I'm, I, I do think there's a you know, we're not in a period of untrammeled globalization. It's all a positive in the way that perhaps we were a decade ago. And our responsibility is therefore to really be clear where global capabilities and assets truly deliver benefits locally as well. So when I talked about resilience, you know, I'm, I'm quite clear that the global infrastructure that we build, the, the tools that use global data to protect against fraud, deliver day in, day out to the citizens in, of Europe and therefore have a local benefit by by being global. But I think there's an expectation that you have to take the global assets and deliver them in a tailored and important way lo locally, and that we cannot just assume that lo global is good. We have, we have to deliver locally those great global assets. I think the second big topic is how, in a time of change, how do you create the structures with private and public organizations that enable innovation to happen, but that for consumer needs to continue to be met in a good way. And in, in a way, I think there's sort of a Maslow hierarchy of payments. And if you remember the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy, there's water, fire, air, security. What is security? And, and we need to collectively work on what, is, what should the expectations be and how do we all continue to deliver that? By the way, the next level of, of Maslow is love and belonging which in my payments translation is how do you create open structures that enable new, new players to emerge that solve problems and needs that we didn't even imagine, which is what you need in a period of change. So open networks, welcoming all participants. And then actually the top, by the way, of, of Maslow is self-esteem. And for me, that's all the kind of cool innovations that are taking place with data. So I think there's that sort of second theme of how do you create the right structures in a period of change and the right engagements at the right level of Maslow to to, to sort of set a path that will both create security and trust and the competition that you want to meet the needs that you don't even imagine yet. And then lastly, I think there's topics that we are going to have to engage in because they're bigger than us. One is data ethics. What really should be the set of values and how we use data and what tools do we use and what expectations should consumers have about that? And that is beginning to be formulated around the world and sometimes in very different ways. Uh, and the other one is also, what role do you play with inclusion and sustainable economies? You know, for me, payments do an awful lot to support the growth of economy in a digital world. But I think an expectation on all companies is they are going to need to play a role in those topics as well. So that would be my sort of three different levels. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, and then, Michael, what sort of three big trends are you seeing? Um, and again, you know, how do you think the community can come together to actually overcome some of these friction points? Well, t talking about three, um, uh, as in our chart, we have three big ambitions um, and we call them three stands. Uh, the, the first is that we want to accelerate uh, the, um, the drive to zero, zero emission. We don't talk about this here in this forum. Uh, the second is to increase the participation around the world, participation in the economy. And uh, instant payments or easy payments in a national schema, uh, they play a big role in that uh, to help the unbanked uh, participate in the economy. And the third of our ambition is uh, foster uh, international global trade. We simply believe, despite all the uh, political turmoils, that international global trade is very important uh, in order to have a uh, an equal uh, living standards uh, across our world. And if you think about it, what is trade? Trade is you bring services and goods from A to B and you bring the payments from B to A. 
As a matter of fact, there were times when it was easier to ship physical goods from A to B and know exactly where it is than to do the payment the other way around. Yeah. So mm. these initiatives, which we have been seeing, yeah, uh, are actually enabling that the payments will, uh, the payments will be transparent, secure, and um, fast. And, and that's what we are driving for. We want to have uh, the fastest payment possible in a national and an international environment to give our customers, retail and wholesale, the biggest uh, advantage of their liquidity. Because we don't want to block, block liquidity somewhere in the middle, but we want to leave it either on the uh, buyer or on the seller side or the seller and buyer side. And that's our belief and we do everything uh, to enable that. And therefore, I think cross-border uh, payment initiatives very important uh, and will keep us busy for a long time. Aether, I can see you nodding quite a bit there. Did you want to add anything else? Well, I think there's a, a lot of, I mean, great points have both been made by, um, by the other panelists. And I think that the data ethics and ethics and AI and, and um, are a key theme. I think we need to think about um, globally because there's, you know, we've seen over the last couple of years, um, various regulatory regimes take a different stance on data privacy, whether it's onshore or offshore, what has to be where, who can use it, who can see it. Um, and then um, how we then use that data to enhance the customer is, is really um, an open d debate, which I think is something that the industry needs to embrace. Um, to sort of keep us all, uh, keep things fair. Because I think that then ties to the financial inclusion. Because if the entire, you know, if the entire industry goes one direction, it could leave a big segment of the population out. Um, and I, I do think that the other um, point around, you know, climate change has been interesting, how it's sort of come in and out on the basis of what we've been talking about around um, cryptocurrencies. So there's a, lot of, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of things in there, but I think that we've got um, a good opportunity ahead of us. And the last point I would just make for the, for us in terms of priorities that haven't been mentioned. And again, it's, it's really driving into that embedded banking. How do we think about putting ourselves into the right parts of the ecosystem so that you're kind of what you're there physically or digitally where, where your clients are acting uh, in a way that's uh, accretive to them. And that's really sort of our, our last you know, pillar that we're focused on. Excellent. And Charlotte, I'll give you last word if you wanted to add anything else. I think I think I've run out of words. I'm afraid. Well, that's fair enough. It's been such an interesting. Sorry. You're probably quite grateful for that. Well, I have to say it's been such an interesting debate. Um, so thank you so much, Charlotte, Michael, and Aether, for all your insights. And I hope you have a fantastic Cyboss week. Thank you. Very nice to see you. Thank you. Very nice to meet you both remotely. You. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, sure.